Hello and welcome to episode 16 of the EMS Handoff Podcast, your source for all things EMS. Before we get started back this week, we want to thank our host of the podcast, the Journal of Emergency Medical Services. So make sure and take a trip by their website at gems.com and show them thanks for hosting us and for all they do for EMS as well. So we're going to welcome back our co-hosts this week, Bradley Dean and Eric McCullough. From east to west, let's go ahead and start off in North Carolina. Bradley Dean, tell us what it is. Man, it's, it's been a great week. Um, it's rainy and cold. But, it is. Uh, it is. You know, I don't, I don't really understand. You know, we, we live right between two lakes, and you would imagine with all the, the weather we've had, um, the storms and such uh, throughout the, the winter holiday and even snow and everything that we'd have water in the lakes. And they've drained those down for some reason, but it is cold and uh, stormy. In fact, we're uh, getting notifications already that some of our campuses are opening late tomorrow due to uh, uh, poor weather. Yeah. And I am wearing my shirt. So, hey, yeah, hey right there. Hey, let's go ahead and give that shout out, pursueoutfitters.com front slash EMS handoff. Checking out that sweet gear uh, right there. Uh, the other side of the state, uh, for me, uh, the west side, we got Eric McCullough back in. He's uh, he's 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 bought him, Bradley, but he's not sporting it yet, man. Eric, what's going on? I got it. I got my shirt right here. I got it. Oh, it yeah. All right. But the lighting's he's terrible. Got the, yeah. Um, he's got the I, black on black. I know. I like it. I think it's cool. It's Makes sweet. people kind of look and go, what is that? Um, so it is freezing here. They've already called off um, things. Oh, Bradley's got his red shirt. Good. I need to get the red shirt so it's more obvious. Um, by the time this comes out, hopefully snowpocalypse or whatever they're calling it this time has ended. So um, that's pretty much what we're getting ready to weather is. Um, we don't do that well on I-24 corridor here in Tennessee. We don't we don't do ice and snow at all. So I'm trying to stay away from it as much as possible. We we do fine over here on the east side. It's only, you know, they always talk about the southerners. It's only in Middle Tennessee that's a problem. Yeah, hey, further man, south, yeah. <laughs> I mean, what better service on podcast can you have than my son is bringing these freshly baked cookies in here? Holy cow! Let us get started though, so I can enjoy this cookie. Bradley Dean, we've got some uh, great a great guest tonight. We do. Uh, so we've actually got two guests tonight that are going to talk a little bit about uh, you know, gamification of EMS and, and education stuff. So we've got Dr. Uh, Mark Cicero, who's an associ associate professor of pediatric emergency medicine at the Yale School of Medicine and the director of pediatric uh, disaster preparedness program. He's an EMS physician, uh, an attending physician at Yale New Haven uh, Children's Hospital. He has uh, designed experimental and didactic curricula in pediatric disaster medicine, uh, has numerous publications in uh, tri about triage, pre-hospital response. He's a member of the National Biodefense Science Board and the principal investigator for the Pediatric Research and Disaster Education, or the PRIDE Network, uh, which has received funding from uh, HRSA and the AHRQ. Uh, Dr. Cicero, thank you for joining us. I'll let you fill in any uh, blanks there. No, there's no blanks. Thank you so much, Bradley. Appreciate the opportunity. No, you're welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Walner, who's an ass assistant professor and clinician uh, educator at McMaster University and an associate medical director for the Center for Paramedic Education and Research in Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, she works as an EMS and emergency medicine physician. In addition to innovative curriculum design and medical leadership, she dabbles in research and advancing equity, diversity, and inclusion in medical education. Dr. Walner, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Glad to be here as well. I like the fact that as she said, it, she just dabbles a little bit. I know. That's, you know, yeah. I, I, a little, a little, I dip a my toes scattered. in it sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> no, if anybody dabbles in research, that would be me because I don't get to do it that often. So, well, so we started this uh, conversation immediately after the 2021 uh, annual meeting and conference for the National Association of EMS Physicians. Uh, Dr. Cicero and Waller uh, were part of the team that were presenting a uh, pre-conference. And when people think about pre-conferences and, and dealing with four hours, especially four hours on 
a Zoom session. Ultimately, it's it's, it's uh, one of those things that's kind of like, ouch, you know, it's going to be a big deal. But however, uh, as we as I got a chance to sit in here and, and talk to physicians across the country, talking about uh, disaster education and, and getting into this game theory, it was a uh, it was really interesting and kind of opened my eyes and some of it I'd seen before, uh, some of the stuff that we've been doing as well, but, uh, I want to go ahead and kick it over to, to Dr. Cicero and Dr. Waller, just kind of talk about, uh, where all of this kind of started, uh, in your all's eyes. Uh, sure. I'll, I'll start us off a little bit. Uh, First of all, uh, David, I'd like to thank you and all the participants in that NAMSP pre-conference for taking the leap of faith to do a workshop remotely. Uh, the NAMSP and other professional organizations are now entrenched in uh, the current world of continuing education and delivering this content uh, virtually, but also having real interaction with something that we were all a little skeptical about. but. Thankfully, we all had a chance to get to know each other pretty well and learn about education in EMS and how simulation and gamification can be used. So you asked, you know, how did this all get started? And uh, maybe I'll geek out a little bit later on in our conversation and take us to the 1840s. But uh, thinking about more modern EMS and how this all got started, I think it's an idea whose time has come thinking about demographic trends in EMS, thinking about how so many EMS providers have played up, uh, grown, grown up playing games, whether those were analog games, board games, video games. And uh, really one of the things that we've seen crystallized during the pandemic has been the idea that classroom-based learning or even in-person simulation um, may not be feasible or safe and also that uh, the reality of a 24-hour workday uh, and continuing education or even when our, uh, when our trainees are learning to be paramedics or learning to be M EMTs, they often don't have the luxury of, um, you know, of just doing that, of just being a trainee. They need to work in order to make ends meet. So having good solid, well thought out education that can be accessible to them, that can be fun, it can be relevant, it can be a really nice supplement to uh, their more traditional learning styles. So uh, I think that it's it's been a slow burn, but uh, it's really caught fire over this last year. And I'm curious, Claire, you know, for you, with your experience in, uh, in gaming, uh, you know, where you've seen things take off, uh, and, and, and how it's, uh, and where its roots are in your neck of the woods. Yeah. Yeah. So part of it too, is how do we teach some of those more difficult fundamental concepts? Um, like for us, it started with the question of how do you teach an early learner about how patient flow works in an emergency department? How do you manage the whole thing or normal? normally they're still grappling with the, well, what causes chest pain and what tests do I order? Um, and so some of these things are harder to teach than you can get just out of a didactic one person standing there telling you about it. And so that's really where the gaming and the simulations and those other things can come in too, is that you can get that broader idea of how, how does flow work? Give somebody who's an early learner a chance to make some of those higher stakes decisions in a very low stakes environment that's successful. And for a lot of us, it's, we all have different learning styles. For those of us who trend, tend towards emergency medicine and pre-hospital medicine, a lot of us tend to be very physical learners or we enjoy doing things. <laughs> and that's what makes it make more sense. So that's another way. Um, and so, like you said, too, these trends over time have been building for a while. It's been changing in adult education in general and is finally leaking into medical education. And it's, like you said, one of those things, once it starts, it's really started to take off and everybody's finding different ways to utilize all of these technologies and techniques. So oh, one of the things that kind of pops to mind when we, when we mention this is the uh, Robin's Robin Williams movie Patch Adams 
And mm-hmm. you take a look at the historical way that the medical education always was. You had the stuffy professor, uh, probably was was uh, you know fifty years old when the the building that they were being educated in hundreds of years ago was f- finally being built. The starched white coat. And he was the end all be all, and you had to listen. And if you didn't, and and then they had kind of the learners that you had in the background. Uh, from, from, and I can't remember the, all the characters, but you had the one that was in the book all the time. He was the roommate of Patch and, uh, you know, was very serious and the, the female student there as well, same way. And then you had Patch that kind of was different. It's like, Hey, I have to go in and put it into play. And he found ways to do that. So when we talk about the initial learners and I've actually had the opportunity to be back in a classroom, uh, the last week, the last couple of weeks uh, as well. And, you know, to hear the number of students say, Hey, I'm that hands-on learner and, you know, having problems with this and how can we tie? Because on that initial learner side, uh, we, as, as you mentioned, Dr. Waller, we're really kind of at that point in time, just trying to open the head and pour in the information. And unfortunately, as we're pouring, it's basically coming out the ears at the same time. So uh, just trying to find ways. and, And now we're actually starting to see, Hey, this may not be the way if we find a way to make it interesting uh, find a way to get it to catch on. We start to see that uh, going just from that initial level or, and going up to the higher orders of thinking. Yeah, right. it's, inter- it's interesting. It's something we see like with our paramedics go through this long training session and then they pass their exams. And in theory, they've had all of this education and they have this series of uh, interviews like OSCE type tests where they sit down with the medical directors too. And it's interesting. You'll see the ones, some of them will do it immediately after, and some of them will do it after doing a consolidation period of actually being on the road and sort of mentoring. And the only ones who ever struggle are the ones that do it right after. And you would think like in theory, they've had all the training, like they know the facts, but you don't have some, you don't have the experience to latch it on to. Yeah. The the best, the best thing about, uh, about didactic training is it is a good way to give a whole lot of information to a whole lot of people all at once. But to go with your analogy of pouring it in and it comes out their ears, that's so true. We know that it is the least good way to help knowledge stick. One of the things that makes gaming, whether that is uh, an analog game, uh, whether it's a video game, or I'll even lump Uh, medical simulation into this is all of those ways of learning. They have rules. They approximate what being out in the field looks like the same rules, the same stakes, the same, um, the same decisions that can be made and the way that the scenario or the game can play out is, uh, it, it, really, there's so many different ways. And in some situations, it may even be an infinite number of ways that a game can play out, which is very different from sitting in a didactic session going slide by slide by slide. Mm-hmm. So the learning that happens there does a lot of things to actively engage the learners. Um, you know, we all maybe remember our time in high school or elementary school. I have uh, Uh, two elementary school kids and one who's a middle schooler. And right now they're doing okay with remote learning because their minds are still kind of sponge-like and they can take things in and it's enough to know that they need to know it because there's going to be a test or uh, it's the expectation that they're going to learn it. But once we reach adulthood, we need some context, we need some reasons, and we need some rules, and uh, we need some stakes and some reasons to learn. And a game, uh, in a very serious way, uh, life is a game and uh, practice is a game. And we can learn the skills that we need and the context from a game. So let, let me ask you this question, Dr. Cicero, if you don't mind. Why do you think then if, if you know, most of the studies that we see show that the retention of that activity is so much higher than just the didactic side? Why is there such a stranglehold to keep that traditional speech delivery? I, I know you mentioned a minute ago that it's a great way to get a lot of information to a lot of people in a short period of time. But if that's if that's not the case, if if you know we're taking 100 people and eliminating half of them because they're not keeping that and not keeping the material and passing forward, why is there such a stranglehold to keep that? 
Um, I think this is one of those situations where inertia and a ship of education, it's a, it's a hard boat to steer and to change course. If I am that 50 year old starched coat uh, lecturer, honestly, 50 isn't that far off for me anymore. Uh, you know, <laughs> we can I'm change that lecture, if we need. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. That's fine. I'm, I'm feeling good here in my mid forties. But, but the point being, you know, if I'm giving a lecture and it's just like the lecture I gave last year, and maybe I update my slides for a few minutes before I give that lecture, that doesn't require much of a leap versus going from giving the same lecture about respiratory distress I've been giving since the Clinton administration and, uh, you know, and, uh, and just kind of polishing it up a little bit. It's very different to then go into a situation where we are flipping the classroom or we're asking the learners to play a video game or we're asking them to sit down and roll some dice and, uh, you know, and, and add elements of risk and chance. It's a different way of learning. And I think that people often fear new concepts and new ways of doing things. So in a simple way, that's that's one of the reasons why I think the stranglehold exists, even though there's a lot of good evidence. Uh, Dr. Walner, I'm curious mm -hmm. what you think. Definitely. And then so there's the you have to get your educators to buy in and get used to teaching in this other way, which for me works because I've always hated being like the lecturer in front of a giant group of people. It's like my least w favorite way to teach ever. Um, but then you also have to, like you said, steering the whole institution, <laughs> you have to get the whole institution to flip. So in medical school, traditionally, you wouldn't even start any clinical exposure until after the first few years, um, which has been changing from the time that I was in medical school, we started right off partly because of people like Patch Adams <laughs> changing things. And now in some places like here at McMaster, they flipped it entirely where they almost don't have any didactics. It's all small group problem-based learning and the students have to figure out how to solve the case. And it's interesting because it gets them thinking in a clinical question kind of way, like the way that they're gonna get taught in residency and so forth, but it's, so there's huge shifts coming but it's slow and it takes a while for it to trickle into medical education and then to change a whole institution. It just, it takes a while. I think yeah. we're getting there and we've made huge changes, but we can definitely do more and better. So with that, because as you mentioned, we're, we're kind of changing from that senior person up at the front of the classroom that's, that's controlling again, that, that whole room. And then, you know, depending on the size, they may have, you know, graduate assistant, teaching assistants that's with them, kind of keeping that control. Now we're pushing that uh, that emphasis off to the small group. So we kind of have to then motivate also that internal locus that says, you know, I now am responsible. It's not this teacher that's up front. Mm -hmm. It's now up to me to make sure that I pass. Now they're going to make sure that I get whatever I need and pass that on. But I have to, and, and as long as we feed in, and kind of build that internal locus, then they can then grow at the same time. It, it's, it's kind of refreshing as an instructor, as an educator to, to go to this kind of model, because in a way it takes the pressure off. You know, uh, if we have a, an expectation that the learners are going to bring knowledge to the table and new ideas, uh, there it almost becomes something like the project echo model from the university of New Mexico, the idea that all learn and all teach. And this is something that takes the pressure off because the expectation isn't that that instructor up at the front knows everything, but the expectation is that that instructor up at the front can, uh, help people access what's known and and has a, a set of skills that they can impart to to gain the knowledge and learn the knowledge and uh and that can apply in, in small group learning it can apply in games as well um it was interesting i, I, I have a question because um <clears throat> one of the one of the things we're talking about when flipping the classroom or doing anything like that is since i know many probably many educators are going to be listening to this um very curious. Um, getting the buy-in from instructors that were so used to is so ingrained into their culture that all the work has to be done by the instructors because a true flip classroom design looks a lot less like 
the instructor's doing the work and the students are doing the work. Have y'all had any um, fallback from that or any um, resistance to that? And if you have, um, what have you been able to encourage or how have you been able to, to handle those situations? Well, I think it's like any new thing for a lot of folks I found once, some of it has to do with just lack of familiarity and once they've been exposed to it or been the, on the learner side of that kind of model, all of a sudden there's much more willingness to embrace it. And it's just having, it's a new teaching skill. So if it's somebody who's a great lecturer, who's had time to perfect their topics that they're teaching and they're so comfortable in it, it's a whole new set of skills that now they have to perfect. But a lot of times having some more experience with it seems to spark that interest of, oh, actually, this is really interesting. I can do so many things with it. So. Right. When, when that lecture. Go ahead, Dr. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, I was just going to say, when that lecturer has heard themselves give that talk, who knows how many times, and then they, um, you know, the new way of learning is something that they had some experience with, uh, Often, again, it's refreshing and, uh, you know, once uh, the novelty and maybe the fear of trying something new goes away, there's, there's uh, a new willingness to accept it. And then another thing as far as the barrier is um, time and expectations, uh, you know, in a kind of a sedimentary kind of way uh, will be what makes the shift. Um, the more people we have, uh, regardless of their generation, who've had this experience, uh, e even folks uh, who might be our parents' age who are, are, who are still teaching, once they've had the opportunity to try it, if they're willing to try it, they'll come along and there'll be fewer and fewer people who want to hold on to the old way. Mm -hmm. So let, let's go ahead and jump into games. And before we do, I want to talk a little bit uh, about the average uh, uh, attention span of the adult. Uh, I don't know if you all uh, ever watched any of the videos that's put out by a guy named Eric Qualman. And, uh, you know, he does a lot about social engagement and uh, he talks a lot about statistics. And one of the things he has in one of his videos, and we'll link it in the show notes as well, is uh, he said the attention span of a goldfish is eight seconds. <laughs> the average attention span of the adult is seven. <laughs> And so, you know, that that really kind of hits. It's like, oh, hey, this little bitty goldfish in my tank. I actually can pay attention some longer than even I can. Uh, but even my wife, who uh, she's she's at a university here locally uh, and teaches in education, and she's kind of changed her way. So a lot of her videos, you know, they are required to do an introduction at the very beginning of class, especially if it's an online class, to show that they've attended and she, you know, usually everybody puts it, hey, you got to tell us who you are, 250 words about ourselves and respond to two people. Uh, if you've ever been in online education, it's, you know, it's it's that busy work kind of tell me who you are. And if you've been doing it for very long, you've got a document that's saved on your computer. You go in, copy and paste it. And she changed hers this year or actually last year that all of her introductory uh, assignments actually were to create a TikTok style video introducing yourself, including a dance if you wanted to. But as long as your your peers uh, could figure out who you are and something about you. And she said the engagement of that went tremendously. Like people actually created songs about themselves. And, they, you know, and, and so they they bought in because it was stuff that they're already doing and fun and engaging. Right. Exactly. And that's. That bit of engagement is part of the key. How do you get everyone engaged and get them a chance to practice all these different skills? And when you're engaged in different ways, it actually sinks in and you learn better. You might actually retain something versus, like you said, it pours in your head and falls out your ears five seconds later. <laughs> all right. Are, so as we, is, sorry, go ahead. As I say, what your wife is doing there is, um, meeting the learners where they are as far as what they're familiar with and what's going to be fun for them. You know, similarly, if we're talking about a population of learners who are in their twenties, thirties, forties, who've grown up playing video games or grown up playing games in general, it's a way of learning that meets them where they are and is going to get them engaged and interested. 
All right. So using gamification in, in EMS education, disaster management itself, uh, the example that uh, we have here is in history, we talk about military war games, right? Yeah, absolutely. So this idea of games in the military is um, it may go back longer than uh, what I'm about to talk about. As far as modern war games, there's this idea that the Prussian army recognized that when they went into battle, the cavalry, the infantry, the artillery, they all knew what they were going to do. They knew how to fire their guns, how to manage the cannon, what formations the horses would go in. But the group in the army who didn't know how to manage the situation was the officers. The officers had gone to school, had learned some theory, some philosophy of war. But as far as how it's going to look when people are losing their lives, war, and when, uh, when there's a ridge that needs to be taken and the effort doesn't work, there was a real gap there. And I am not a war historian, uh, have no military background, but in thinking about this from a game standpoint, I think it's interesting the way modern EMS has its roots in the military, or at least some roots in the military, and also modern simulations and games uh, that we use for EMS education can be traced back to 1840 when the Prussian military was training its officers to see what the risks were, make plans, have contingency plans, work together, have a social aspect as far as uh, communicating about what was best to be done. And the idea of war games have their roots that uh, those of you who've served in the military could certainly give me an education about. What I've read is that um, the U.S. Navy during World War II would conduct war games that would go on for weeks on end, thinking about the Pacific theater. And also, of course, there are limitations to games and humbling things for us as, as game designers that can be learned from how war games in Vietnam, where there was a larger sized army that could be potentially uh, uh, brought to bear and better weapons, better resources that uh, the U.S. might have. Uh, there were factors that couldn't be accounted for uh, during war games and the attempt to quantify uh, the, uh, the field of battle uh, didn't take into account and wasn't a good model for Vietnam. So thinking about, uh, thinking about that as a history in war games and how EMS has its roots in the military, uh, you know, we can think about how simulation and games today in, in EMS serve for uh, thinking about the problem solving, the communications, and uh, getting people ready for realistic response to, uh, to high stakes situations. Yeah, so in take, this, I'm oh, sorry, Dr. Wall, go oh, ahead. I was gonna say, and it can take many forms. Like you said, there's the, very large scale, like you're talking about kind of like what a lot of systems will do for large scale disaster planning, where you'll take actual ambulances and put them out or helicopters to pick up fake patients and transport between hospitals and work it out. But there's also the lower scale where you can do just tabletop sims or card games or the computer game where it's, you're playing through the same concepts, but on a much smaller scale which gets to drilling down different concepts and you get different experiences. You won't get the same full sensation of figuring out what is it actually like to run up that ridge and will the equipment function there, but you might still get the concept of, how, well, how do I manage it? Hey, it and There's that's a very good point. That, that's where I was actually getting ready to go as well. And we keep using the term gamification, gaming, uh, but this is really many different aspects. It's not just like playing on an Xbox, jumping on a computer or tablet. It's it's all across the spectrum. And, and I know we'll talk about it here in just a few where we get into actual card games or board game style and then also some computer aspects. But as you mentioned, you know, these can be broken down. So we know ultimately if you you practice or you play the way you practice and, and the old average adage is, you know, uh, practice makes perfect. And then you go perfect practice makes permanent. And that's, you know, ultimately what we're going at is that every time we take a look at what we're doing, 
we're trying to make some aspect better. So this can go from not only the initial learner, but also those continuing education aspects as well. You know, as you come back in, you kind of learn the next generation of the new things as well. We can either go again, set them up on that computer station and, and go through something, put them in that tabletop. And actually our institution is getting ready to do that on an active shooter uh, scenario. You know, there's a lot of things and we're going to find where just those written policies kind of break down by talking about it. And then we're going to put it to a full scale response. And you kind of use each one. They they all kind of play on each other um, that, you know, they're not they're not simulating hitting that ridge until they've broken down. All right. These are the components that we have to do. So let, let's talk about that then. Let's start on the uh, the I guess lower fidelity side, kind of the board card game style. What what kind of stuff is out there right now for EMS education and how can it be employed? Yeah, so I think and there's also two broad concepts there. Like there's gamification where you're taking mechanics of games and using them in other ways, like within a curricular design. And then there's serious games in and of themselves, which is more what we're talking about here, where it's a game, it's something that you play, it's engaging, it's fun. But the point of it isn't just to be entertaining, but also to teach us something. Um, so there's definitely been a lot of homegrown games where like local systems have made up their own sort of a tabletop drill. Some of us, like myself included, we've actually made a card game that you can play that teaches mass casualty triage um, and lets you simulate using cards patient flow through setting up a triage disaster and sending patients through the hospital with limited resources. Um, and I think right now that's really exploding, especially now that resources have changed. Um, what made the difference for us is we were able to find a supplier where you could go to them with your own game design and then they just make it as you want it. So rather than having to find a way to get enough supplies to get somebody to give you 50 games that then you'd have to figure out how to pay for or sell. They make it one off as you need it. So you can each classroom or each service or whomever. Um, and we've been seeing it in, you know, for us, for free hospital and emergency department simulation, but there's also one that's teaching antibiotic use and that kind of thing. So car games themselves have been exploding for sure. Have you seen other things in your area, Mark? Um, you know, I've seen what I like to call proto games, mm -hmm. which are, there are some elements of games involved in the tabletop exercise. There's a timer, there's a certain number of points that can be uh, earned. Uh, there's a need to collaborate. Um, but I haven't seen too much of uh, that sort of analog or full on uh, card or board gate uh, based game prior to when you and I started working together. Um, I, I think that uh, there are opportunities there that, uh, that we're not taking advantage of. Uh, and I think that uh, there's some advantages potentially to these sorts of games when we can get a group of people around a table mm -hmm. um, you know, that uh, it may spur some conversation in a way that tabletop exercises maybe struggle to do. Uh, even the best tabletop exercises that I've been part of, it, it, it bears some similarity to there's a person up front who's kind of leading it. Everyone's sitting around the table, you get a chance to meet the folks on the fire side, not on the police side, the state troopers are there. If it's done at a, at a airport, then the airport uh, team is there. But um, if there's truly a game and some stakes and some rules, I think the sort of work that you're doing could be a better fit for getting people to talk and work together. Mm -hmm. All right. So moving on from there, I do know that uh, one uh, is one that we discussed uh, during uh, the NAM, NAEMSP pre-con workshop, uh, which was the uh, 60 Seconds to Survival uh, which was a pretty neat opportunity and kind of ran through it uh, just a little bit as well. So let's go ahead and kind of introduce that as well. 
Sure thing. Uh, 60 Seconds to Survival was a video game, still is a video game, that we had the opportunity to develop with our team here at Yale and then partners across the country, 21 different uh, sites for EMS training that involves a uh, three-board video game, three different levels, uh, a school shooting, a uh, multifamily house fire, and a tornado. And uh, we designed that video game around the start jumpstart triage system. The idea is that the player is among the first EMS providers on the scene and there's a need to triage the patients, make some decisions about some life-saving interventions and, uh, and then decide about uh, transport decisions. And that game, uh, you know, certainly has a lot of aspects of, of being a game, there's a timer, there's a scoring system, there's a way to compare how you're doing to how uh, other players have done. And um, it, it has interaction with, with patients. And it also, it was a bit, I keep using the word humbling. It was humbling to realize that a generous grant from a federal agency is at least two orders of magnitude less money than the budget for a commercially available uh, you know, high uh, yield kind of video game. So uh, the video game is available for free and it uh, it's really gotten a lot of, uh, of good reviews from the learners. Not only have they told us that they like using it more than being in a didactic setting, not really a surprise there, but the research that we've done around the video game has shown that uh, when we compared the improvement in triage accuracy for people who played the game to improvements in triage accuracy from a previously designed curriculum that used uh, actor and mannequin-based simulation, the improvement was similar. And what's really cool about that is uh, the time in a simulation center for instructors and to get people to physically go to a simulation site um, you know, as opposed to having this video game available for people to use when there's a little downtime on shift, if that happens, or uh, something that they can do between more traditional coursework is really kind of a game changer, no pun intended, because um, it's available in a distributive way for learners when they want to access it. And um, I'm going to give a shout out to another uh, video game. I have no commercial interest in any of the products I'm about to, to share, but our own video game is available at disastertriagegame.org, uh, available free for use. And then another uh, site that I may be worth putting in the show notes is uh, virtualheroes.biz, which uh, is another mass casualty training uh, piece. Again, it's a good fit for people who grew up playing video games. And these games have the advantage of uh, playing different ways each time so that there's replay value. And, you know, so uh, as we were just going through here, I was looking at some of the others and even Limmer Creative uh, is starting to come up with some of these uh, as far as a, a new uh, game that they were looking at uh, coming out uh, called EMT Adventure. So very similar to the same philosophy and, you know, this kind of goes into another route as well. You kind of mentioned some of the new technologies uh, that are coming out. Uh, we know that there's uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, and even mixed use reality with the Microsoft HoloLens. And we're starting to see a boom in this kind of stuff with, say, the um, HTC Vive or the Oculus Quest. Now that these things are starting to become more uh, abundant uh, because the resources uh, are you know, people are buying them more, so costs are coming down, but also there's more people starting to to build into those. And I know from our use, we've actually started to implement the Microsoft HoloLens uh, based on, honestly, actually from uh, input. Uh, there was actually a webinar that came out between the Cleveland Clinic and Case Western Reserve University's medical school, and the dean was talking about the the HoloLens. So we actually uh, we're early adopters of HoloLens and some of the anatomy products out there. Uh, getting to put this headset on where you can actually kind of see every aspect of a heart in 3D right there. You can walk around, see the anterior, posterior sides of the heart. You can actually watch the valves in, in action and how the blood flow comes through. 
uh, it's one of those things that we can we can describe it. And even if you get that kind of poet that has the the words to really describe anything, it pales in comparison to actually watching it work. Even even cutting a cadaver open and and holding the heart only gives you so much. But to see that in action, uh, so what have you guys seen with the the augmented virtual or mixed use realities? I think I've seen a lot of people just starting to figure out how we could get that to apply. So prototypes in different places, you know, starting initial pilot studies, trying to design a curriculum, to figure out how there's definitely, you could see how that could augment the, that big simulation experience, right? Where you kind of get that sensation of before having to be there in real life and actually dealing with the mass casualty and the chaos and the emotional chaos that goes along with it. It gives you a chance to sort of run through that. Um, I think that's also just on the cutting edge of stuff. We're just starting to see at some educational conferences and that kind of thing. So I think we'll be seeing more of it in the future for sure. And, and I think this actually goes into another, another layer uh, because uh, one of the things that, uh, that the HoloLens will do, and it was evidenced as evidently one of the components with Case Western Reserve is that headset uh, could actually bring you into the classroom. So, you know, the instructor-led environment will create it and everybody that's in the classroom has the opportunity to see and, and say that I'm sick. And we'll just, you know, in today's environment, the pandemic being one of the big things, I'm either quarantined or COVID positive currently, and I can't be there. I miss out on a tremendous amount. These headsets are actually allowing you to come in and still see uh, that environment. So uh, kind of seeing that that way, uh, really the way ahead to still keep that engagement, uh, even when you're not able to be in the classroom itself. Right. This is where um, some 80s and 90s science fiction has become... 20 uh 20s uh reality and um i think that the headsets that we have now will look back uh 20 30 years from now at these headsets the way we look at computers um you know from the, the 1990 as far as their capabilities the level of reality and i think that's okay i think that's okay because the fundamentals kind of still apply uh, if we're using virtual reality to create a game, it still needs to engage the learners, have some rules, have some applicability to what day-to-day -day practice in the back of an ambulance or in an emergency department looks like. And th these concepts are going to apply to virtual reality and also to the learning technique that's around the corner that we may not have the ability to look around the corner and see yet. Uh, the fundamentals will still apply. but. Um, Looking for ways to apply this is something that's really interesting for uh, people in education. And there's a growing number of applications that are out there. Uh, so the uh, Pediatric Education for Pre-Hospitals uh, Providers course, or PEP, has a new version that's just been released. And that involves some virtual reality modules that are compatible with, I believe, the Oculus pro uh, products and uh, potentially HoloLens as well. Uh, there's a growing number of VR offerings that are available that can be checked out at trade shows. And um, this is that sort of stage where it's gone from being the new toy to another learning mode that we're still trying to find ways to adapt and see how it fits into EMS education. And just like uh, so many other things, the pandemic has hit fast forward on the adoption of this technology. Now, one of the key things is, though, it's it can't be something that we just go out, pick up off the shelf and throw to the students. We have to actually no take the take from the instructor side the time to say hey I, I need to actually spend time researching and understanding and implementing this or learning implementation strategy so it's not a distraction because if we do get into some of the stuff we can actually shift off course and while something that is good that's supposed to be helpful can actually become harmful exactly you don't want to get distracted by the technology you're trying to use it should be helpful and sort of magical fall into the background where the important things are 
like you said, what is, what is the application? What is the story you're telling? What is it that we're learning? And some of it too, once you get things up and going, the instructor kind of turns into like from the role-playing game Dungeons and Dragons days, you turn into the dungeon master where the instructor is the one sort of guiding the course and letting the, bring the tale through its story and setting the challenges and can sort of controlling some of that chaos. Um, and I, I think that's a good point too, because um, it's, it's nice to have the coolest toys, the neatest, the neatest technology, but without um, thoughtful instructional design, all of that kind of falls flat. And um, my background was in educational technology. And I've seen that where we would go through these waves of like, this is the coolest thing. You should try this out. And then an instructor would try it out. They're like, oh, it didn't work. But really, it, it wasn't the technology that didn't work. It was the instructional background. It was the instructional um, form. Framework. That yeah, yeah, framework that didn't work. Have you guys seen that too in, in building that up? Yes, both ways. <laughs> where it works beautifully. You can do amazing, engaging things with, you know, construction paper and index cards or post-it notes. Um, and you can have something totally fall flat using a beautiful looking video game. Or if it's just something you're getting caught up on the technology, it's like watching our kids go through their Zoom classrooms where sometimes it works beautifully. And other times it's 10 kids going, what am I supposed to be doing? What am I supposed to be doing? And you know, one person's logged in five times and so they echo and sound like a robot every time. So it can go both ways. And we've seen that even in just the traditional lecture when you go to a presentation mm -hmm. and yep. somebody doesn't take the time to go and, and kind of scope out their environment beforehand, make sure that they have the right connectors and they have the, you know, yep. uh, uh, everything works. And then all of a sudden they take the first five, 10, 15 minutes of an hour long presentation, uh, you know, focused on why this stuff doesn't work versus either getting it right before you even start or just going, Hey, I can't get this to work. We're going to, we're going to press on because we know the knowledge already, or we know the information and we're going to present it. So, uh, you know, I, I think both uh, Dr. Cicero and Dr. Waller made good points that, you know, these are all uh, very rapidly, especially with the COVID pandemic now, mm -hmm. uh, very rapidly um, integrating technologies uh, that we're starting to see. And it's really kind of opened the eyes to a lot of people saying, hey, this has changed the way we are. And the question is, are we going back to where we were before? Are we going to push this forward and, and take a look at some of the different opportunities that we have? And I think if you take a look at some of the ones that both of our guests today have said, uh, these opportunities going from even those small game card board, uh, board game style uh, games up to the computer based or even just those, those larger scale simulations, can, can have a profound impact on our education. So uh, as we start to wrap up today, I'm gonna give both of you an opportunity to just kind of give us your final thoughts for today. And also how uh, would people be able to get a hold of you if they wanted more information? And Dr. Waller, go ahead and start off with you. Sure, well, I think one of the things that always amazes me and I find so exciting to be in education at this time is that there are so many tools out there and with this concept of flipping the classroom and becoming more engaged with adult learners there's so many different ways you can go and you can take little bits of each thing and mix them all together and make something really robust and engaging and interesting um and as far as reaching me i am on twitter i'm trying i'm a novice twitter user just like i dabble in research i'm dabbling in real social media um, which I believe we'll put up there, but also by email works as well. And we'll give some links to the triaged game so people can check out what the card game was that I was talking about as well. Uh, I'm, th there's a movie that's coming to mind and I, it's going to Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. And I really <laughs> don't think that's the one when you talk about the spoonful, uh, the, the candy making there. Uh, and it's, it's going to, as soon as we get done tonight, that movie's going to hit me, but uh, thank you for that. And Dr. Cicero, any final thoughts and contact information for you? 
Sure thing. This is again, just like uh, Dr. Walner said, this is a really exciting time to be involved in EMS education. It's also a really exciting time to be involved in EMS education research, which is a great subdiscipline in its own right. There's a lot of ways to compare how the efficacy of one way of learning works compared to another and thinking about everything from how well do the learners like it to how did that educational intervention change outcomes for patients or change practice. And I think there remains a need for this sort of work. And as all these new styles of learning or combinations of the old and new come into play, there's a need to come up with some good, hard evidence to see what works and what works equally well. Uh, So thank you for the opportunity. I can be reached at mark.cicero at yale.edu. And although I'm not on Twitter, you can also reach me on Instagram at Pediaraptor. That's P-E-D-I-A-R-A-P-T-O-R. I'm happy to talk with you there and you'll see a lot of uh, photos of my family and our Australian shepherds. That that is probably one of the best uh, handles right there, Pediaraptor. Uh, That's some creativity. Right there, good. Uh, so definitely a, a great thing, Eric or Bradley. Any last thoughts from you guys? Um, yeah, my, my last thought would be if you're an educator and regardless of your experience level, my my emphasis is always just try it out. Just try something out. Do something. Start with simple. Don't do something crazy complex. Just do one part of one lesson plan and see how it works out. You may decide you enjoy it. Um, and then you can just kind of build on it from there. Even if you don't enjoy it or it's not that great, uh, go back and, and just try something new. Don't get stuck in the old way of saying, well, this has always worked this way. Well, we can always improve and get better. It, and one thing I, w- I will say is, you know, using games and using things like that to, to do stuff keeps people engaged. So do it and, and make sure that you, give them the opportunity to make those decisions is the closer you're going to get to the real world. And great opportunity to make mistakes. That's where, that's where we learn, right? These, these, these opportunities allow us to make mistakes and uh, don't have a patient there at the end uh, whose life is going to make a, it's going to make a difference on. We can make them in the, in the tra- educational side and then we're ready to go. So, Hey guys, uh, as we conclude today, the very first thing I want to men- mention, huh, make mention about is uh, as a reminder about our new EMS handoff uh, clothing line with our partners, Pursuit Outfitters. So make sure and take a look at PursuitOutfitters.com forward slash EMS handoff. Uh, we have t-shirts, long sleeve shirts and hoodies all available to you. They'll print those up and get them directly out to you. Uh, we're starting to see those uh, pop around, all three of us. I know uh, uh, Jason, our former, uh, our last guest, uh, has got his already. So uh, make sure you get yours. And make sure you go out to not only Apple, but Google. And if you're on Spotify now and find the EMS Today by Jim's podcast, and you'll make sure and get every one of our new episodes. So make sure and subscribe, rate, and review on their uh, podcast platforms to give them some uh, love, basically. And don't forget to follow us on uh, on Instagram and on Facebook and our newest edition, the website at the, at the emshandoff.com. And feel free to reach out to any one of us at our own new email addresses as well. First name and last name at the emshandoff.com. And so, as we always like to say, as we end these episodes, Take care, stay safe, do great work, and always remember the value of your EMS handoff.